water surfing. One of the major things that we tell people for a lot of items in training is there are moments of training and there are moments, moments of management. And this is in all the training we do. So by that I mean training is teaching your dog a skill that then helps them either learn to do something or help them to change a behavior that uh, maybe you want to alter somehow. So management is the prevention of the behavior occurring in the first place, which sounds maybe a little broad, so let me dig in slightly. So management in the, in the instance of counter surfing would be preventing your dog from counter surfing in the beginning so that they're not practicing that behavior and therefore it becomes one of their go-to rehearsed behaviors that they're likely to repeat in um, in the future. Again, remember anything that a dog practices or rehearses and then is rewarded for, whether purposely or not by you or the environment, is then going to get repeated more likely in the future. So if your dog has access to the countertops and the likelihood is there that your dog is going to jump up on the countertop or say on the coffee table, it's, it's, even if they don't find a morsel of food, it's instantly rewarding for them because the act of jumping up and looking around was fulfilled. The desire was fulfilled. So um, if you can prevent that and manage their behavior so that they're not practicing counter surfing, you are gonna make leaps and bounds. If a dog is not doing that, then they're not going to increase the likelihood of it happening more in the future because there's not that possibility, anticipation, oh, they're leaving the room, I'm gonna see what's up on the countertop once they leave the room. And you know you've seen that look in your dog's eyes. You are walking away and they're like, ha ha ha, maybe, oh yeah, I don't see them anymore. And they go up to the countertop. So the key for changing counter surfing behavior is to manage. Oh good, thanks Carla. I have a fairly open concept space right here, which I'll show you in a second. So there's a huge wide opening here that leads into my kitchen. Then there's a doorway over there and a wider doorway over this on this side. So um, you might be thinking, well, how are we gonna close that off and prevent the dog from going in there? Actually quite easily. I'm fortunate that I trained Jasper a long time ago to not jump up on coffee tables or counters. He's obviously a low rider, so it's hard for him to jump up on the counters, but he certainly can beg. And even the act of jumping up and begging or pawing at my legs is not only annoying, but is, again, practicing that sort of inappropriate behavior. So we taught him right away that we want him to go to a place and sit down when I'm doing something with food in the kitchen. But before that, um, when I was in a different home, different location, I did use baby gates because Christine made the great point of, I just don't want to deal with it. And that is, right? I mean, that it's so true. Quote, unquote, from the trainer. From the trainer. <laughs> and, and honestly, I mean, that's the whole thing that we want to give you is real life training. Some so relief. Some relief. <laughs> and, 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 and you're not living in this bubble of a perfect trainer's world. You are living in a real world with a real dog and you need quick fixes and that is going to get you a quick fix. So I said to Christine, well, what do you think about, um, about one thing that I suggest sometimes, which is, um, let's say you've trained your dog to leave it, meaning leave the counter um, surface or the coffee table surface alone, you know, don't go near that. And then your dog understands the cue, your dog understands the behavior they're supposed to not do, and then maybe do something else instead, but they choose to anyway. <laughs> and then I said, um, we're not into punishment per se because that teaches the dog nothing. What if you do a timeout, which is to take the dog and tether them to a very secluded place in the house? And there's a whole method to doing that. And she made an excellent point of, I basically don't take the baby gates down until I know that they're not going to do it because I don't want to deal with it. And they're going to still have, they're going to again have that opportunity if they don't know what's appropriate. If I'm not paying attention and, and which is real life and multitasking right, right? which is real life yeah. yep and you don't have one eye on them and one eye on whatever it is you're trying to do in your life which is really difficult then the opportunity is going to be there for them to do that so unless they are there you can feel secure you can feel confident that your dog understands that the counter is a no-go surface use your baby gates that's the second reason probably why I tend to avoid that too aside from 
practice not wanting to have to pay attention and not have to like drop what I'm doing right. <laughs> when I'm trying to cook or something um, to catch and do it. I find that there aren't too many behaviors that have been proof where I, someone could say my dog knows that for sure. Um, 100% of the time. I could lay $100 down and my dog's going to do it. Um, it's pretty rare. I think I've got like two things maybe between my two dogs that I would say 100 bucks, they'll do it if I ask. And, and why is that? You're a professional trainer. How come, Christine? Um, well, part of it is because there are so many things to teach the dog. <laughs> so there's just so much going on. Um, it takes time to learn each individual cue and then prove it and add distractions and put it into different scenarios and generalize it to different people. So the amount of things that realistically your average dog owner is going to have the time and just, I guess, fortitude to make it happen, <laughs> like to really, yeah. really, really stick to that um, is not going to be that many things. It's just not realistic if that's not something that you spend all day doing. Yeah, absolutely sure. And that's coming training. from a professional trainer. Now, mind you, she's out training other people's dogs a lot. So our time that we can dedicate to training our own dogs mm -hmm. might be a little more limited. But honestly, it's that's like real life for you. Yeah. And so it's also about setting realistic expectations. You know, a lot of times um, when we think of dog training, we think, well, you know, you train your dog and it's done. And they know it and we move on. That's not how it works. It's like any other muscle memory. If you haven't ridden a bicycle in a while, the first time you get on one, you're like, okay, Right, I got this. It's all there, but I had to just check myself for a second. Or behind a, um, a car when you haven't driven in a very long time. But then there's also, also just the expectations of my dog is naturally going to want to get up on a counter or investigate where there's something that smells good or I know something that smells good was there before. Just it's normal behavior. Just natural, normal species. behavior for their species, exactly. I mean, so work within those confines. In the meantime, the baby gates or dividers you want to be looking for have to have um, certain qualities. They have to be sturdy. Um, if you have a larger dog or even a dog that's smaller that likes to jump and pounce. Um, they also, I prefer to um, preferably have vertical slats in them so your dog can't just scale over the, um, the barrier. Um, the ones that have the cross hatching, um, many dogs will just be like, well, this is awesome now. Mom and dad have given me a tool I can just climb right over. Thanks. And before you know it, they're in there and you're wondering how they do that. Also, some dogs are um, really great at levitating, <laughs> so they'll just hop right over it. And if your dog can scale a six foot privacy fence with coyote rollers on the top. Wow, with coyote rollers. Yeah, and she's 35 pounds. Wow. But you know what? She doesn't jump our baby gate in the house. And do you think it's the sound of it? Um, no, I think it's because that is something that I was actually able to successfully let her not get rewarded for in there doing it and yeah. then rewarded her heavily for being on the other side. That's great. Let's circle back to that. And I have another dog that does it too. Yeah. So coyote rollers, for any of, the, of you who don't know what those are, are um, you can make them at home DIY with PVC and that sort of thing. But basically it's a, a, an item that is um, round shaped and it allows your dog, it does not allow your dog to get any traction going over the top of a fence. And it's a coyote roller because coyotes cannot cross into your fence either. Normally. Supposedly. But supposedly, but if they've got mad skills like Christine's dog, maybe they can. So they're, they're really big in the Southwest. So we want something sturdy. We want something that they can't scale. And then we want something also tall because as I mentioned, some dogs can levitate. So we certainly want something that your dog cannot just leap right over. Um, you can certainly stack two tall, two short ones. Yeah, you can. Exactly. Um, two baby gates, one on top of the other, um, just wedged into the doorway. Um, plenty of plenty of ways to do this. Um, I find a lot of dogs even not just like the sound of the or fence, whatever it is, when they touch it and they'll back away from it. And so it instantly becomes this thing that they just want to stay away from, which is convenient if that happens. Yeah, I thought that most things go out. Motivation, right? Is, yeah. it, is it, I mean, food is a very big motivation for an animal to get to. And it's just so satisfying. It's almost mm -hmm. becomes like a game. Um, and the curiosity of what could possibly be up there today and that random chance of reinforcement of it could be hot dog buns. It could be my treats are sitting up there. It could be anything. So the grease that's that the grease that's still that you didn't clean up. Yeah, they might smell it from in the living room and just be like, I gotta get in there. So remember, whatever it is that's drawing them to to getting over that barrier, a squirrel outside of 
um, a fence with a coyote roller, which is like, wow, that's really tough, but she made it. So remember, your dog's going to have this motivation to get in there that's really strong, so it's going to be really difficult, and you need to help them. It's not that they're trying to be bad or spiteful or sure it may have become even a game for them that let me see what I can find up there, but they're not trying to annoy you. They're not trying to be bad. They're simply investigating something that is amazing and um, perhaps smells good to them or is fun. Yeah, you can help uh, take some of the... I guess pressure off too, just to know yeah. that it is a normal thing for dogs to do. Mm -hmm. They are opportunistic foragers, so they do yeah. as species scavenge for their food. And as we talked about in our enrichment um, Facebook Live, the seeking part, the foraging, it's very is, satisfying. In and of itself, is fun yeah. um, and rewarding, whether or not you actually find anything. So it's yeah. really you're you're up against a lot, and they're up against a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, just have some patience with yourself. Yeah. And Just have some patience with yourself yeah. and with your dog because it's a tough thing. Yeah, it all goes back to the nose. Remember, that's one of their primary ways of gathering information and getting satisfaction. And sniffing, smelling, chewing is so soothing, satisfying, and joyful for them. So this is not something we want to diminish. This is something we want to help them manage because, again, we're asking them to live in our homes and follow our rules and it is not natural to them, as domesticated as they may be. So, um, again, set your expectations wisely and just take the possibility out of the equation of barriers. So, uh, Christine has put some links into the comments for you to click on and see some um, ideas of what we would recommend, the types of, of different barriers. Do you all know what an X pen is? Do you want to describe that for them? Sure. Um, if you may have heard it referred to as an exercise pen or like a puppy pen. Um, it's basically just three standing gates that you can attach and form something so they can be in a circle and a straight line however you want it. Um, and you can have them together so that you can keep something inside. So people, people often have like puppies in them um, or sometimes little kittens if it's an adoption pen. Um, and they often sometimes will have a gate so they can come in and out, things like that. But it's pretty much a way to keep your puppy safely contained with more space than in a crate. But where, say, there isn't necessarily a room in your house that is able to be puppy-proofed, um, you can kind of create that space yeah. for yourself. Yeah, and great for bigger or older dogs as well, no matter the size, because you have a containment area or you can cordon off one of your natural rooms to have them outside of where you want them to be. <laughs>